took me about John Bosco Manny. That's actually spelled wrong. The end. This, this is actually sorry about that. Uh, there's, a, there's an actually it was a second um, presentation. Anyway, John, but better known as Bosco. He's uh, not most, some most people possibly have had first first uh, hand knowledge of him. Um, others were just known by his reputation. Uh, he was a superb surgeon, but particularly excellent at uh, teaching. We've already heard that uh, he was went to UCD, so did I. And um, he unusually he had a, a membership and a fellowship, which is kind of an unusual combination. Um, he also got his MCH, and then he was a consultant surgeon down in uh, Wexford. These photographs, you, you get the idea from these photographs, what a nice, what a nice gentleman he was, what his personality shines through these photographs. Jerry McEntee actually gave me these photos, he's a very good friend of his. It's the work. Just moving on there. Oh, thank you. So, um, more, many of the consultant surgeons in, in, in Ireland have benefited from his teaching. Here you can see, you see Zena and Orla, who one of the two that went down to Wexford to benefit from his uh, his training. And uh, as I said, he was a, a superb surgeon. He also is an excellent character. And um, again, fun person to be with. It's I think it's kind of like everybody Everybody has their have their have their problems. We all have kind of little Achilles heels. I think his Achilles heel, apparently, one of my one of our mutual friends was saying, he liked skiing, but he wasn't great at it. Um, he was very good with snow plowing and going in a straight line, but uh, he wasn't able to no negotiate going around corners. But anyway, he's 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 certainly solely missed. So. Um, I'm just going to go talk about, uh, I said, my, my experience as a surgeon for the last couple of years. I don't really want to do it just particularly about my experience. So, so I've kind of uh, informally asked uh, some of my colleagues to get their experience also about what was the good and bad about being being a, being a general, being a, a consultant surgeon. As far as I was concerned, as, as you heard, I, I, I did a, my training here and in Toronto, and um, we're known as otolaryngologists, otorhinolaryngologists, head and neck surgeons, but mostly knows, knows as, as ENT surgeons. And ENT would be kind of, this is what I've been doing mostly for the last 32 years in James's, doing nasty operations to very nice people for good reasons, because they all, they all have obviously cancer. Not always successful though, I'm afraid. So that was the many ears I've taken off. And a good few noses. Neville would appreciate them if he sees these sort of photographs. And throat, obviously, with larynxes and pharynxes. And um, T could also stand for thyroid. Like I mean, I've done over 3,000 thyroidectomies. It seems like an awful lot, but I, was, but I was counting the other day. And unfortunately, I've taken E could stand for eyes as well. We took a lot of eyes away. And or we could have an O in there, oral cavity, and an S, salivary gland. But um, the aim of this talk was, I said, just to look at my experience, but also just maybe some, you might get some benefit from from um, what, I, what I've experienced, but also I wanted to give a better idea, not just my experience, but also some of my consultant experience, experiences. And to be included in this, and this is a very, not like a usual statistics uh, prospective study. It's, it's just, it was more, what I've done was roped in a lot of my colleagues who to be included in this, they had to be a surgeon and had to be at least 25 years as a consultant and still practicing. Uh, it's completely biased. And um, there were, but there were very, I have to say, most of us done phone calls over coffee between operations. Uh, waylaid on the corridor, and a lot of people have started to avoid me after a while. I noticed that. Um, you, you know who you are, people who have asked. Uh, these are these are the the different specialties that I particularly asked to, to be involved. And as far as the results are concerned, uh, 
I wanted to get a kind of representative sample of consultants and, you know, particularly male, female. It was very difficult. Those criteria are not very stringent. It was very difficult to get female consultants for this. Um, this is a famous photograph in the College of Surgeons. Thanks, Camilla, to give me a copy of it. Um, and it shows basically what it was like in ENT 30 years ago at our, at our, at our meetings. It's just purely males. It spots the female. There was very few. Um, and at the time when I was when I was actually uh, appointed, there were only four female um, consultants in in surgery in, in Ireland at the time. Um, we, it was just I asked some of my colleagues why was that, and they said basically they weren't encouraged to do surgery. Like they were, you know, they, this always it was always brought up to career versus family, etc. There's no real direct discrimination as such, or they didn't tell me about it. But and but one of the problems, of course, there was no there was nobody to lead the way for them. But um, in in E and T, we had one, as you know, Laura, and for mostly for the 1990s, she was the sole person. Uh, thankfully, it's actually changing now. The consultant gender is is changing to a certain extent. Maybe Max Fax isn't doing so good, but um, and. In um, in E and T, when I did I did a kind of a head count there recently, approximately a quarter of the consultant E and T surgeons around the country are female, and it's improving. If you look at this, we got this rota recently to see who who's going to be working with me, poor people, and uh, you can see half of them are females. So when you ask uh, some consultants what. What are the changes, my colleagues? What, what, have, what have been the changes over their their time uh, as consultants? You get a list of different things. Some of them are seen here. I don't. I'm not going to go through all these. But basically, uh, when I was uh, becoming a consultant, it was for many of the many of the positions, particularly in orthopedics and in general surgery. Many of the consultants were quite, you know, they were in the forties often. They were waiting around a long, long time. So that certainly has improved, and there's. Training would be, to my mind, more structured, and the sub-specialization sounds great. What's the bad things? A lot of people that I talk to, I, you, you forget that a lot of the a lot of the hospitals still the, the same hospitals that we started off in 30 years ago. Even though there's a few bits of pieces going around it, they're still pretty much the same. Um, there's always the usual thing about too many, too many patients, too much paperwork, etc. Um, as far as the standing has been, as has been uh, respect for a consultant, it's probably when you get to become a consultant, you feel that you know this is great. I remember I'm from Athlone, and people from from you know, certainly was there was respected that you were appointed as a consultant, but that that kind of respect has gone a little bit. Um, one of my colleagues recently I met, and he's from England, and he got a job as a uh, an ENT consultant over there, a, a very prestigious job. And he was telling me he, he's actually comes from Liverpool, and his family they're all quite, quite working class. Half of them were Liverpool supporters, half of them were Everton supporters, and uh, he was quite a good footballer. He was in uh, he's one of the junior teams for Liverpool, but as he went through college, he had to give it up. And unfortunately, and I think for his studies, but uh, eventually, twelve years on, he became a consultant, and he wanted to break the news to his granny at one at a family uh, do. Went over to his granny and says, "Grant, no, told her, told her the good news that he was a an and T consultant, uh, a, a professor." I says, "But Nikki, you could have been a, a footballer." So it's not quite the same situation. Anyway, as far as what's well, I'm going to, what's important as far as surgeons are concerned, these are the things that you really want to know. What's changed over the years? Tater time, types of operation, number of operations. This is my, this is what I was, these are the tater time I was given as consultant. You'd love this now, wouldn't you? Uh, full day Monday, double taters all day Tuesday, double taters all day Thursday, day ward facilities and et cetera, et cetera. You just don't get that. And you know, I I despair of people getting jobs these days to get half a day at theatre. It's just not good enough. The surgical operations that, that you're doing. One of my uh, 
old professors in Toronto said to me one day, I didn't, I thought he was a bit cracked. He said, you know, most of the operations I'm doing now, I was never taught as a resident. Um, but this, this is the reality. Most of the things that you've been taught, the operations are going to change over the next 30 years. These are some of the lists of operations. When I came back, we weren't, I wasn't taught how to do these in, in residency. And now they're some of the commonest ENT sur surgical procedures we do. Here, what you can also expect is that you'll do smaller numbers, uh, sorry, smaller types of operations, but higher, bigger numbers. So you get better and better at smaller number of operations. Here, this is typical. I just looked at my parathyroid operations. You know, 20 years ago, I was only doing one every month. Now I'm doing one to two a week. So that's going to change. Um, you don't get too over specialized though. I remember as a as a intern, um, most of the lists when we used to put them up, this was a very common operation, highly selective agotomy. There were lists and lists of these, highly selective agotomy. It's never done anymore now because of medication. So you have to be a little bit careful about becoming over specialized. Even the kind of typical thyroidectomy that's changed since I've been doing it. Small, it's gone from a big incision to most of our decisions now were less than three centimeters. And even then things are changing. Some people, if you're in, if you're in Korea, you might get a, an auxiliary approach. If you're in the States, for instance, in California, they, might, they may say we'll combine it with a facelift, which is a nice idea. Um, in Belgium, they're trying to do it uh, through natural RF surgery in some cases. So this is changing and everything changes. So you can expect change. Some less important changes that have occurred. This is one of my colleagues, Colm, came down to, I was, in, I was in Zao patients there recently, and you can see he's wearing scrubs. You wouldn't be caught dead wearing scrubs as a consultant 30 years ago. Just wouldn't happen. It's tie, it a shirt and tie. There also seems to be quite a few professors around these days. I'm not quite sure. It kind of leads to kind of when people call professor, everybody seems to turn around. You can see it here. So what's some of the things that I think should have changed just very br briefly? Parking is a disaster in our hospitals. We need to sort that out. You need crash facilities and you need a gym if you want to have people actually uh, come into hospital and you want cheaper coffee. Coffee is extremely expensive. And James is, is two euros 50. Anyway, so that's, 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 exp oh, it's that, so the three euros 50 maybe. I, I get the, I, I use the card. I don't use the cash anymore. Uh, what are the, some of the, some of the worst aspects of being a consultant? Now, the first one, everybody, agree with this. This is the first thing that's out of people's mouth as a, as a, over their, their time as a consultant. The death of a patient. We all have patients that die, but these are often unexpected deaths, often small procedures and often preventable. And it is devastating. It's often this Swiss cheese effect, a small number of errors and compounded by the, the come into alignment and then lead to a major, a major problem. When I was a about 20, 30 years ago, I was asked by the coroner to give to, to assess a case of uh, of an unexpected death. And uh, just very briefly, I'd say it, the patient had a neck operation. It was done later on in the evening because of the long and it became a long procedure. It was quite complicated. I went back to the ward late. The nurses on the on the ward looked at the neck. It was quite swollen. Instead of calling for somebody, they measured it to see whether it was like a, a DVT. A year, an hour later, they decided that maybe we should ask somebody to come along. They asked for the intern. The intern was very busy up, putting drips up, et cetera, et cetera. Didn't come for about half an hour. The patient became more and more distressed. They called for the surgeon. He was in the theater. They called for the anesthetist and the patient, when the, and the anesthetist came down to the patient, found the patient very distressed, decided to intubate the patient uh, on the ward and give a muscle relaxant. So all these little steps led to the demise of the patient. So it's, it's, it just, it's, that's, and that's what happens. It's demoralizing though. The second, so you can unfortunately expect an unexpected death and it is not nice. 
coroner's court. Coroner, the idea of coroner is to decide on what's happened in patients who've unexpected problems in, in death. And they're looking for, they're not looking to blame people. They just want to see wh why it happened, where it happened, and um, the actual site of where it happened. So it's, um, I, I've been at the coroner's court once, and I just want to just warn you a little bit about this. Uh, coroner's court, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a court, and there's loads of lawyers and uh, barristers going around it's quite, it's not, we're out of our depth there to a certain extent. Make sure you prepare for the coroner's court, because if you don't, you'll be sorry. What happens is the car, that this coroner's court happens a couple of years after the event. And a lot of people, a lot of the protagonists that may have been involved in the treatment of that patient may have gone abroad and may not be around. And you may be the sole person that, that was, that the, that name to come along, give evidence. So if you're in doubt, make sure you work out what has happened before they all leave and even have an internal investigation because it's, it's, a, it's a worry if you don't. The other thing to be careful of is you don't realise this, but when you go down there, if it's a slow news day, people, to, to be loads of uh, newspaper people outside, even cameras, and you can get quite a shock and you don't particularly want to be involved in that. The medical council. Every one of my colleagues have been referred to the Medical Council, including myself. So expect it. Just one of those things. It's like getting the slap in the face, but it's not nice. When it happened to me, I felt, oh, that was the, like, I, the, the, I was thought I was being nice to the patient. And I did, and just it, obviously I wasn't. They, they obviously didn't appreciate what I was, what I was telling them. I do remember I came in, there was this is about, a long time ago, I came in on that Tuesday, quite bitter, annoyed, and I talked to one of my, I met one of my senior co colleagues, who was quite aloof type of individual, you know, difficult to talk to really. But he said, "Con, what's your problem? I've been, I've been uh, referred to the medical council multiple times," and I said, "Oh, okay." And he said, "In fact, the last time I was referred to the medical council, I never even met the patient." I said, well, that's a bit strange. He told me that he was in his rooms one day. He was a bit, he was in bad humour. His secretary went out to do some chore or other. The phone kept ringing and ringing and ringing. And of course, he, answer, he answered at the end. It was a lady from Waterford looking for a private appointment to see him. And he was so rude on the phone that she referred him to the medical council. So, but so that made me feel better. But expect it. But the ma majority of these never go anywhere. Ninety percent of them never go anywhere. But it is unpleasant. I'm not going to mention too much about medical legal. It's uh, unsustainable the amount of money we're going, we're paying on this. It's a adversarial situation, and uh, you know it's 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 not very pleasant. But it's similar to the the medical council situation. Um, one of the things that I was unaware of, and this came up with a number of my colleagues, uh, was this kind of social media problem. I'm a pure Luddite with this, but this has become, a, a lot of my colleagues brought this up about particularly trolling. And uh, if you don't know what trolling is, it's basically putting out comments in, in the social media that's in public arena. and you feel that they're unjustified and it often leads to problems which are practice and patients given out about you can cause you major problems, major sleepless nights. These are some of the things that some of my colleagues said that were put out about them. The devil, low life, shouldn't be, should be struck off. The thing is, you, you, you're, you're in a situation where you, you can't, you've not come back with these, these uh, people because you cannot uh, you can't have a have a uh, a situation where you, you try to answer these uh, comments uh, on online situation. You can't do that because the medical council will be after you. Um, you will, as far as the medical council is concerned, they uh, you if you if you actually say something about these people online, you are giving out confidential information that they're actually a patient of yours and you'll end up in hot soup. So really 
you, you, all you can do is grim and bear to a certain extent. And that's what you trying to get them trying to get them to change their mind is nearly impossible. The other thing is doxing, which happened to a couple of the pay, my, my colleagues as well, where they get information regarding something that you don't want them to know about. Everybody has their skeletons and they don't want them publicized and they're up on, on, in a social media setting. And uh, it's probably illegal to a certain extent, but it it's a bit of a, a, a gray area. If you're trying to avoid doxing, you want to be careful. Uh, minimize your social exposure. That's really what you need to do. Um, you need to be careful with passwords and let, giving out information like date of birth for your children, because we all use those to make passwords. But it is it's a growing problem. Just for for this, uh, I, I said I'd better look and see if anybody's mentioned me on the social media. And here's two of the ones that were you were invited to talked about or to, 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 to assess me. Uh, nobody had, which is, I'm not sure it was, I'm not sure it was good or bad. I was certainly, uh, I like the superb green part of it there. I was certainly, uh, I was tempted, but I didn't go and do it. Okay, so there's the bad things about being a consultant. Uh, there are good things about being a consultant. I have to say, most of my colleagues said they love their job. Um, the collegiality, it's pretty well paid. Uh, you, you Patients do really appreciate you, especially at Christmas. And um, you do get, you do get, you do get a lot of presents. Um, you get a lot of these cards, you've changed my life. Well, sometimes, sometimes I say that, but um, it's, 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 it's very nice. Uh, I asked some of my colleagues, what was the best present they got? One of my colleagues um, said, well, she loves horses. She got a horse as a present. And it was. she said it was the best and worst present that she got because she loved horses, but she duly fell off it and had a subdural hematoma and four fractured lumbar vertebrae. So that's why it was the best and the worst. This is supposed to be me. Uh, this one is a present I got. Uh, it's. I don't think there's that much of a likeness. Um, I was intrigued to get this because I'm from Athlone and uh, a lot of my friends in Athlone, their fathers all used Old Spice. I never used it myself, but they all used it. And I got this from a, a, a gentleman from Athlone. I have to say, I was going to use it and then I re-gifted it to, a, um, to one, of my, one of my colleagues in James's. Uh, he's a dermatologist who's big into his looks. And... He knows who he is. I don't know if he. I don't know if he used it or not. I have a kind of a love hate relationship with this chap, Padre Pio. Uh, he's dead for the last fifty years, but uh, I seem to get loads of patients that love him. He's kind of a subgroup of patients. Uh, um, they give me his rosary beads, uh, his I have his mug, uh, I have a few things. But the the difficulty is like you know when. They, they, they said when, when you're doing the operation and it goes well, Padre Pio, or he was, he, your hands, Padre Pio. But of course, when it goes badly wrong, forget it. They don't forget all about Padre Pio. I got two kind of unusual presents, two at the same time, pretty much. Uh, one was this, I, I wasn't sure what, I'm not sure how people taught me really as a consultant, I got these. This is one that my kids use for Halloween quite a lot. Uh, it actually fitted me perfectly, but it was a a big game hunting safari outfit. Uh, well, I subsequently lost the hat, but and then the next about three or four weeks later, I got this. It's a twelve foot long snakeskin, and I said, "Gee, well, I, it's apparently a boa constrictor or something or other." Uh, the chap who gave it to me said. He, his father was a uh, farmer out in the Far East. He was out there and they came across one of his goats that had been strangled by this snake. They shot the snake and uh, skinned the snake and then said, who will we give it to? It's going to be me, of course. So I don't know what to do with this snake. Um, here I am showing it off. I, 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 may have a, I may have a singing career afterwards. never know. I accept that one. Anyway, just uh, the last part of this, what advice would you give oneself? Uh, when I asked 
some of my colleagues, it was um, it was trying to generalise and very specific advice. Uh, generalised ones is what you'd expect, really. Listen to your patients, be nice to your patients, you know, get a work-life balance. Uh, you can't satisfy everybody. And these are all very relevant. Uh, specific ones, and this came up quite a lot. Uh, a lot of my colleagues said this, uh, don't look for an early consultancy. That's easy for them to say, of course. They've been a consultant for 25 years, but don't look for an early consultant. Do that second fellowship, do that extra training, because you, you'll feel you'll you, you'll you'll appreciate it more. Um, I was lucky to do a fellowship with in in Toronto, and um, Pat Kilain was my my mentor there. Uh, he was a, just a fellow of this college, and I, I learned a lot from 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 him. It kind of I got confidence there. Uh, it, it demystified the whole situation. If you're at a meeting and these guys are talking and saying, "I've done a thousand of these and a thousand of that." You know, when you go there. It, they're often very similar to you. They're doing the same thing as you're doing. Uh, so, it may, and also, if you live abroad, it makes you more mature. I, I think, you know, I would say it makes you lucky as well, because it's very hard to be lucky. But you have to have the best training to be lucky. That's what you need to do. Get the best training. That's how the only way. Just like uh, Napoleon said, but he wants lucky um, generals. But you want to be a lucky surgeon. I put this in one of my one of my uh, mates as it is. He was very specific, very animated about giving the advice that he would give. Don't go near consultant jobs in Dublin. Um, he was he was talking about quality of life, cheaper houses, nicer patients, and uh, schools, etc. So you can take that as you will. I, I'm not sure. Um, I would say a few things about uh, if when you're starting off as a consultant, take a holiday before you actually um, become a consultant. Take a, a four to six weeks holiday. That's the long, longest holiday that you're going to get till you're retired. Take it. Try and build a half day into your week if you can. Breaks up the week. It's, it's really helpful. A lot of people try and use that time up for you, but it's very helpful. And uh, One thing I, I have done is gone ex-directory not everyone would do would agree with this but i had a colleague that kept getting phone calls in the middle of the night from a patient and uh, being annoyed by it and rang so so i i'm all i'm ex-directory so dealing with patients these are all things that you you you, you already know i'm not going to go through them very great things so what are they when you when you're talking to patients some of the red flags that you want to be careful careful about and when, when you're talking to them and some of these are um sorry sorry about that i'm going back hmm. so i said red flags um do what you want doctor it's only a small operation isn't it uh, I trust you to make that decision. Be careful when you hear this. I, I always, I've trained myself if I hear these things to stop and really tell them, try not to be kind of very nasty to them, but try and tell them, you know, the ins and outs of the operation. They obviously haven't got it and they, they're letting you take all the responsibility, which is not fair. Be careful about some patient that ego stroke you. This, this happens all the time. I was told you were the best. They're really, you know, pushing their luck here. You know what I mean? Don't think you're, they, they haven't told that to other people. Difficult patients, like there are some really difficult patients. When I was a fellow in Toronto, one of, one of, my, one of the ENT colleagues in Ann Arbor was shot dead by a, a, one of the patients who had a septal rhinoplasty. So he was a, quite a difficult patient. Thankfully, they, you know, they, but most of them are not like that. Try not to get angry, even though you're tired and fed up and listen to them, they're going on and on and on. Try not to get angry. You need to develop your own your own vocabulary as well to deal with some of these patients. So often these have have long term problems. They're psychologically problematic. They have multiple complaints, and they want an explanation for nearly every symptom. Uh, some of the things that work for me, you have to make your own ones out. You know, we find it hard to say this, but I don't know what's wrong with you. Like that helps. You know, you can really disarm the patient and say, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, but isn't it great you don't have cancer? That's a really good one to come back on that. 
you do the you do the investigations obviously before you tell them that but uh it it really it really works i can't cure you we really find that hard to say as well i can't cure you like we, we see we're not taught to say that in, in medical school what you're taught to do is try to explain every little symptom drive you mad uh, I, I, I could say maybe, you know, you're an enigma, come back in 100 years, we might know what's going on with you, but we don't know now. And really, this really works. I'm not God. That's if I'm really in bad humor, that's what I would say. I'm not God. I know some of you might find that hard to say, but I could, I'm happy to say it. A lot of patients, when they come to you, they want an operation, which is kind of strange. I, and, and they're disappointed, they're going to have to they're disappointed, don't have an operation. Um, one good way of getting out of this is I want to be able to live myself. You, you don't, you, if you don't want, I don't want to do an operation. I want to be able to live with myself. This other aspect, this, this is a quite a common thing that I, I find about um, uh, the this, this situation where if you operate on somebody, this monkey comes in your shoulder. Now it could be a small monkey, everything goes well. But if it goes badly, it's a bleeding heavy monkey. The only way of getting rid of that monkey so only one way is to get somebody else to operate on that patient for the same problem. And that is, so be careful, particularly if you're referred people that have, have had previous operations. You're taking that monkey off them, so be careful before you do it. Interviews. Interviews are not, can be unpleasant, pleasant. If you're putting, if you're deciding on a, a, a consultant colleague, you know, this is a very important situation. As one of my colleagues used to say, it's like a marriage, it's even more than a marriage. You might see that paid person more than your spouse for quite a long time. But what, and if you don't pick the right person, you could have difficulty. The problem with it is it's like a marriage, but there's no divorce. You're stuck with that person and you want to be careful because it leads to a lot of disharmony. I'll just end on this with this um, slide. Um, just, just be careful. Like, uh, just be careful out there. It's like one of those nineteen eighties um, cop programs. Um, you, you, this patient here, this kind of underlines like what we're dealing with all the time. Like, even straightforward operations can go badly wrong. I won't, I won't uh, hold you too much longer. You can see this lady. I took a photograph of her. It's about twenty years ago. She's a lovely lady. I asked her, could, could I have the photograph? You can see she's a tracheostomy and she's had a sternum split quite recently. I first, I first came across her when I was in James's on a Thursday morning. I was doing a partial glossectomy and an ectosection. I had just done the partial glossectomy, starting the ectosection, and the consultant nieces came through the door out of breath and said, you're needed in ICU straight away, which is un very unusual. So when, when I went up, this lady was uh, unconscious on the bed and there's blood coming from her trachea pretty much everywhere. So like, like I've been taught, let's get her into theater. Well, there's not, but she, uh, I was trying to find out as we could bring her into theater, what was her history? And as you can see, she's quite young. And the history was two years before this, she had, uh, had a thyroid problem, thyroid swelling, it turned out to be papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is an excellent prognosis. She had a thyroid operation, didn't go very well. And they found it hard to remove the thyroid. And it was complicated by hypocalcemia. And she was very breathless afterwards. They didn't diagnose bilateral vocal palsy, but she was very breathless after she was told she had asthma. Um, because it didn't completely remove the thyroid, she'd had external beam radiation, which is not the usual treatment nowadays, but it would have been then, I suppose. And um, she went home. Uh, reasonably well but her breathness became worse and worse and she be, when she became pregnant she was admitted to one of the hospitals in dublin with an airway obstruction she had to have this per, she had to have this tracheostomy put in then and she had a cesarean section that worked worked out fine um the bilateral vocal palsy was diagnosed and they tried to lateralize after the tracheostomy won the cords it wasn't a success because they found it very difficult to extend her neck because of previous surgery and radiation. But when doing that, they, she got a vascular injury and she lost the sight of one of her eyes, or most of one of her eyes because of it. 
So um, things working great, doing well. She had no cancer, but this is she had this, these problems. Uh, when she went home with the new, new baby, started getting this bleeding, and that's where I came in because she'd been admitted to James's, and uh, she had vascular studies done. They couldn't find a bleeding point, so she had a tor she had a sternotomy the day before. They had devascularized her tracheal or trachea and to see could to stop the bleeding but next day I, I i was asked to see her because she was profusely bleeding i explored her neck i was lucky i, I took quite a while we found a, a hole in her common carotid it was probably from pressure necrosis and uh, i put a suture in her thought it was great the vascular surgeon came down and said that's not going to hold uh, i didn't want to put a prosthesis in there because of the tracheostomy infection and radiation so what we did is we just checked her backflow by uh, tying off the common carotid and it seemed to be her circular winds seemed to be intact so we divide we decided we tie off her common carotid even though obviously there's a worry about a, a stroke so i had a sleepless night as many of you will have had and will have and i came uh came into the icu the next morning and here she was just pretty much what she's doing now sitting up and i and she was moving all four limbs and which is great and then she said to me how come she couldn't see out to her good eye? So you can see um, a straightforward operation can go badly wrong. And for all of this, and that's what we live with, with this what this profession that we we've, we've, we are, um, we decided to spend our life in. You just need to get a bit lucky and lucky means being as good as you possibly can. So I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you.